All right, so just, just a uh, quick reminder and heads up. You never, you never purposely try to write a sermon to stomp on someone's toes. That, that's not ever been my attempt yet, but I'm, I'm just giving you a heads up. Between the title and the first line, a lot of y'all's toes are going to hurt. It's not, the, it's not the plan, it's not the intention, it's just the way it is. Yeah, just a happy accident. Title of today's sermon is Timing. So here's the first question. <laughs> Have you ever been late for anything? <laughs> I figured this would be one of those moments where we'd, we'd have to take a few seconds and just figure Everyone's been there. At some point in time, everyone's been there. Did you say you've never been early? <laughs> There's probably a lot more of us that have never been early than never been late. That's, that's probably safe to say. But uh, on the flip side of that, we've, we've also all been waiting on someone, too. Besides maybe Ray. We've, we've, we've all had that feeling like, where is so-and-so? And depending on who that person is, that can, that can bring up a different set of emotions and thoughts for whoever that person may be. But I'm sure either way, we've, we've been on both sides of this. But let's look at some differences on the people that you've waited for in your life. And, I mean, it's specific, but it's still pretty general. So just every parent in here who has a a kid that drives or has before, waiting on a kid can be a very worrisome thing. Be, be very scary. Or if you're like me and you just have a klutzy kid and they're supposed to be walking from Nana's, 700 feet, you kind of get worried from time to time. But what, about, but what about when you're waiting for a friend? You've got this, this friend that's supposed to meet you over here, help you with something. They, they agreed to help. And here, here they are 30 minutes after they said they'd be here. That's probably, at first, a different feeling. That's, that's more of an angry type thing. Where are they? All right, what about a wife? Um, what if you're waiting on your wife? I'm, I'm going to help all y'all out. Keep your mouth shut. Beauty takes a minute. But if, if we're being honest, whether you're waiting on your wife or I know plenty of wives who wait on their husband, that in that situation, that can be a little frustrating. So depending on what the situation is and who you're waiting on, there, there's different ways that we feel in all of those scenarios. Have you ever been in this same place Waiting on God. Where you feel worry, doubt, frustration, anxiety, confusion. It's, it's easy to feel all of these things in that place when we're waiting on God. In those times where we are waiting on God, it, it's easy to feel this way. But... It's important that we understand that while we're waiting for God, we have a choice. We are blessed to be able to lean on our Heavenly Father in our hard times and in our times of waiting. 
If you look at, if you look at the Beatitudes, and read that later, Matthew 5, 13 to 12, but I'm just going to give you just the, the starts of these. It's Matthew 5, starting in 3, says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. At some point in time, we all wait on the Lord, but how we choose to do so is vitally important. Think about all of these situations. If you are mourning and you, you are poor in spirit, how you choose to wait on the Lord to bring healing is a huge deal versus the way that we handle it in our earthly thoughts. With our, with our earthly mind and with our earthly eyes, when, when you're in a place of mourning where you are low in spirit, when we, when we put it the way that the world puts it, we feel beaten down, defeated. We feel, I mean, in all honesty, we, we usually throw ourselves a pretty big pity party. And we just sit there and we start to drown in sorrow. We allow ourselves to go further and further down versus patiently waiting on the Lord and being strengthened and, and allowing Him to bring forth joy in this time. As, as crazy as that might be, some of the, close, some of the people that I know in my life are, are the closest to God. I have seen them go through times of mourning with great joy. Because they're, they're going through that time with God. So let's look at an example in the Bible, a, a really good example of this. Jesus had just just finished preaching a really, really good, really, really long sermon. And after that, he fed a multitude of people who normally did not get along very well, totaling over 5,000 people. The, the way the Bible puts it is Jesus feeds the 5,000. But when you read it and you study, it's, it's saying 5,000 men. So it was a minimum of 5,000 that he fed. And what, what did he use to feed these 5,000 plus people? A handful of fish and bread. That's, I mean, en enough that would not feed the front row here. And he fed 7,500, 10,000, somewhere in there. And they had some leftovers. So with that being said, for the disciples, I'm sure that this was an awesome day. I mean, imagine everything that you just saw if you're one of his disciples in that day. But I'm, I'm also sure that it was probably pretty nerve-wracking, a little bit stressful, physically and mentally draining. If you've got your Bible, we're, we're going to read, read that in Matthew 14. Matthew chapter 14, starting, starting in verse 22. So after all of this has taken place, after this sermon and the multitude have been fed, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat 
and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Luke chapter 8, 24 and 25 ends it this way. Jesus had rebuked the wind and the raging water, and the storm ceased, and there was a calm, and they marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the water obey him? If you have spent much time studying this passage, you know that all of this is miracles stacked on top of miracles and on top of miracles. The disciples witnessed all of it. Let's, let's think of who they were going to preach the good news to that day. They were several, several tribes and people and Gentiles that did not get along. That in itself was nerve-wracking enough. That, that right there was miracle enough. But it just continued. The disciples witnessed every bit of it. But for a second, put yourself in their seat on the boat. Really imagine this for a second. You take, choose whatever disciple you want, you imagine taking their seat on the boat after witnessing every bit of that. You've had a long, long day. You have dealt with crowd control. You have dealt with people who you know do not like you. You have served them. You want to get home to your friends and your family. And now all of a sudden, you're in a boat in the middle of the water and bam, here comes this horrible storm. Not only that, do you, you know, how, how many of y'all have ever been in the middle of the water in like a rowboat or a paddle boat? You work really, really, really hard for a really long time to go nowhere just to survive. So, in that situation, you're one of the disciples on the boat, right? And that's what you're in. Would you consider yourself waiting on Jesus? I can just about guarantee that what would be in your mind, I know what would be in my mind, is where is Jesus? We've seen this dude perform miracle after miracle after miracle today, and here we are, the, the people closest to him, the people helping to carry out his mission, and we're stuck. We're in a bad spot. Of course, we would be wondering, 
Where is our Jesus? And Jesus showed up. He came to them. In their moment of need, He was there with them. And I understand it, it may not be a great time stuck in the boat in the middle of the water during a huge storm. I understand that being poor in spirit does not sound like fun. Mourning is rough. Anyone who's been through a time of mourning, that's, that's hard. Being meek can be a struggle. Being persecuted and reviled while you hunger and thirst for righteousness is not a good time. Look at our world as it is right now. Every person in here who is God's, I promise, is hunger and thirsting for righteousness. Another way, another way of us looking at that is not only do we hunger and thirst for righteousness, but we, we seek justice, and we do not see it in our world right now. We especially do not see it in this country. And if you do do the right thing, very often, do you have things spoke against you falsely? If you are truly living for God these days, this is, this is where you're at. You are, we are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. We are poor in spirit. That's a really good place to be. Because if we go through this, all of these hard things, all of this hard time, if we go through it the right way, if we faithfully wait upon the Lord, this is what the Word tells us to finish there in Matthew 5.12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward where? In heaven. I threw, some, I threw some more verses in on Ben that I didn't get to tell him about just yet. We don't have to write them. We don't have to put them up. I'm, I'm just, I want us to get this in heaven part. So here's just a few. James 1.12 says that if you stand the test, you'll receive the crown of life. Revelations 2 verse 10 says, if you are faithful unto death, crown of life. Second Timothy 4.8 says, all who loved his appearing would receive a crown of righteousness. Revelation 21 verse 4 says, there will be no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more pain. Matthew 25.21, words that i Pray, we are all aiming to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. The promise in all of these verses that I just talked to you about, where is that promise fulfilled? In heaven. It is, it is very easy to, for us to get impatient because if we do the right thing today, we better know about it tomorrow. Here. If I do something nice for one of you this afternoon, my earthly way of thinking is telling me they need to tell me thank you afterwards. We let our very earthly, small minds supersede the fact that while we live here, we may never receive the reward for it until we are in front of our Father in heaven. 
It is important that we wait and that we know that that waiting may last beyond our time leaving here. But with that being said, let's compare the two for a second. Crown of life, crown of righteousness, no more sadness, no more death, no more mourning, no more tears. Well done, good and faithful servant. It's worth it that we wait properly here because nothing that we will receive for it here will compare with that. Not only are we as Christians these days probably a little bit poor in spirit because of the shape that our country is in. Not only are we hungry and thirsty for righteousness, but we are also very impatient. It is, it is far, far more important and it is of far more value that we wait patiently for the Lord and receive our gifts in heaven rather than here. Because what do the things that we do that we pile up here on earth do? They collect dust, rust, They, they go away. If we're willing to wait upon the Lord, the things that we gain are of eternal value. Those are the things that go with us. Not only are we impatient as Christians, but we're also pretty shallow. Because a lot of us and if I'm not speaking for you, I apologize. But a lot of us have carried such great offense against a brother and sister in Christ and thought, how dare they? Because they didn't notice something nice that we did for them. Because they didn't thank us after this. Because they were not blown away and amazed by the growth in which we worked and strived for. No one noticed it. No one took notice of it. No one came alongside me in this hard time and did this and this and this. We are so easily offended, yet so easily forget who it is that we offend when we don't love the way that we should, when we're not thankful the way that we should be, when we're not patient with our brothers and sisters, and when we're not generous with our time and with our efforts. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. What evidence do we have to doubt our Creator? Whether that be the Word of God or your own personal life. What evidence do we have to doubt God? I cannot think of one thing in my life. I cannot think of one time where I felt like God put something on me, I walked through it, where it was not to my benefit, where it did not make me a better person, where it did not get me closer to God. None of us can offer a shred of evidence of why we should not love God better and of why we should ever, ever doubt his love for us. Our faith is strengthened in hard times. Our faith, our faith is strengthened in the time that we wait. Our strength is, our faith is strengthened in our time of need. 
by a show of hands. Have you been closer to God on the mountaintop or in the valley? Raise your hand if, if, if you're a mountaintop person who's closer to God when everything's perfect. Raise your hand if you are much closer to God when you're in that dark, deep, scary valley. That is when we are strengthened. That is when we are closest to God. It is not a time to become impatient. It is not a time to doubt. It is a time to draw closer, to receive more, to become more dependent than we ever have. Peter was... Y'all, hey, we've already done the imagination thing for a minute. Do it again. You're Peter. And you see Jesus walking to you on the water and say, if it is you, command that I come out and join you and that I walk to you. And Jesus is like, yeah, man, go for it. And you start walking to him. Is, is this a moment in time where your faith is being strengthened? You're walking on water. Yeah, your faith is growing exponentially right there in seconds. But as you have your eye on Jesus and you walk to him, the earth creeps back in and tries to pull you away. And what happened? What happened when Jesus, when Jesus was not the focus of Peter anymore? What happened when he began to doubt? He began to sink. Yet there was Jesus' hand to lift him up and to pull him out of the water. If you feel like in any way, shape, or form today that you're sinking, like things around you are building up, if you feel like today you have taken your focus off of God, if you feel like today you are in a place where you feel like you're waiting on God and you've become doubtful or full of worry, maybe a little confused, maybe a little frustrated, if you're in that place today, just as he was with Peter, he is standing there with his hand above you to pull you up, to strengthen you, to be there for you, to be your Savior. I'm telling you today to let him pull you up. Let him be your savior. Let him grab you and hold you tight and restore your faith. Help him to build that faith in your time of waiting. Help it to not be a time of doubt, but a time of strength. For his strength is shown in our weakness. So let those moments happen. Don't worry about him. He, I promise you this morning, he, God really wants to touch somebody and to heal and to bring them out of this place where they feel like they're sinking. But he's not going to do it for you. He won't do it all for you. His hand is there, I'm telling you this morning, just to take it. Receive what he has for you.